go ahead and start the recording and uh, get this thing started. Bruce, you're up. Good morning, folks. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Sorry if I've got background noise. I do not have air conditioning. And unfortunately, my overnight low was not anything less than about 73 degrees, 74 on the toggle. And the house didn't make it down to anything below 80 degrees. So I started off at 80 this morning and it's done nothing to go up. Um, I'm not going to hold it very long. I'd like to go out and spend the bulk of the time in the presentation. The interesting part about FL Digi, for those that have been in the Aries group for at least a while, is that we had we had actually started off on a path to engage folks in digital modes of operation. And at the time that we did this, probably pushing about seven or so years ago, maybe eight at this point, um, there were two very interesting schools out there, if you will, of digital thought for emergency communicators. One was certainly Winlink in its original and more embryonic states. The other one that was actually far more mature and is still in use today, as already mentioned by Rob with Mars and a lot of the other agencies and organizations, is FL Digi. Uh, sometimes you'll see that branded under NB, EMS, Narrow Band Emergency, you know, communications and stuff. Uh, depending on how you go out and run into it flavor-wise, you'll hear FL Digi, sometimes NBEMS under the same interchangeable term. So I'm looking forward to seeing Bill's presentation on this. This is something that we had actually done some workshops on ages ago. Folks were bringing in their radios, bringing in their computers, doing all kinds of interesting things to go out and get them on the air. And we actually did live we actually did live sessions in a meeting room, which was kind of awesome. Um, I've still got photos and videos to prove that. So we'll get started on that shortly. Um, the usual cadence for the morning call. Do we have any folks that are new to Aries? Or if this is their first meeting that they have joined, introduce yourself, raise your hand, say hello, tell us what your interest is. And I'm not sure that I'm seeing any prompts that we have any new folks online. No, I'm not seeing any hands up at all. Okay. I was asked by somebody to do something that I was wondering about, thinking about. And I got to be honest with you, I think it's actually most appropriate in this day and age. Uh, we're doing things virtually. I know it's a colossal inconvenience for some people. This is not how we want to be interacting. This is not the most elegant or eloquent way of conducting business of this type, meetings of this type, volunteer sessions of this type. But having said that, I would like to do the Pledge of Allegiance, even though it's remote, even though it's video, even though it's teleconferencing, even if you're muted. I would like to go out and do the pledge to start the meeting off. And I would like to continue doing that for future meetings. So with that, if you have your cover on, please remove your cover. If you don't, it's okay. I'm not going to ask that it's necessary to stand up. Please do what you feel is appropriate. I am standing myself. If everyone's ready, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, 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 with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, folks. Uh, we have a couple of things going on as far as activities and events. For those that might be six meter enabled, there is actually the fall VHF sprints. Starts today on six meters, four o'clock, our time locally on the left coast. It'll run till eight o'clock. 
any mode of operation. If you need to go out and get detailed instructions and you're actually going to compete and send in the log, I would encourage you to just go online, Google fall VHF sprint. It'll give you any information if you're gonna be submitting logs or doing anything fancy, but effectively there should be some folks on locally on six meters. Uh, any mode of operation will suffice if you're going to participate tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, same time window, and tomorrow is two meter activity. Um, had fun last weekend with the mini drill and the mini call out in the community parks on the air. That was interesting. Got lots of feedback from the group thoughts that we had uh, from participants and folks that were playing in the activity. We'll incorporate those into future events. Um, we have the September VHF contest coming up. That'll probably be the next major event for us to go out and do some VHF related activities, some simplex mapping perhaps, and certainly testing our equipment. There's a great opportunity to go out and do that. And that'll be in a couple of weeks. We'll go out and follow up with information on that as we get closer to the event. Dave, anything else? I know you just stepped away. <laughs> Any other events that you know of on the calendar for the ARRL? Um, Nothing uh, contest-wise. The uh, they have uh, hired a new uh, Aries manager for the ARRL uh, at headquarters. He's a past section manager. Um, he's a past section manager from West Texas. Uh, I know who he is. I've talked to him a few times. So we'll see what that does. Uh, if it changes anything, I doubt it'll change anything the way we're doing it. Um, our system works for our area. So that's, uh, that's the main, main goal. So other than that, uh, like you said, the VHF contest uh, during a couple of weeks. And then we have the great shakeout on October 15th. So um, other than that, we have to, uh, we'll probably plan something somewhat around that. Roger that, thank you. Rob, anything on the training side that we should be aware of? Any other activities that are currently mapped or scheduled? Uh, Bruce, uh, we had penciled in an HF rally, a local HF rally for uh, next Saturday. Would you like to go ahead with that? I do not see any reason why we should not. Please do go forward. Okay, so we'll put out, uh, I'll coordinate uh, some kind of uh, op plan with every, uh, with the leadership and uh, we'll send something out uh, in a few days, uh, HF rally uh, next Saturday. And uh, we get a lot of questions about uh, participation in the national uh, simulated emergency test. The official dates for it are October 3rd and 4th. And uh, so we'll, we'll try to put something together for our San Diego contribution to the, uh, the national SET. Uh, details on that to follow. Uh, that's all for me, K6RJF. Very good, thanks Rob. Uh, for a lot of the folks that are online, I'm sure you probably caught the email, read the email. We had um, earlier in the week activated, if you will, or posted condition yellow for a heightened alert for Aries volunteers. I believe we're gonna continue that in consideration of where we're at with fires, in consideration of where we're at with weather, in consideration of where we're at with possible rolling blackouts or unplanned power outages. We won't talk about earthquake swarms too much, although there's been interesting earthquake activity. You know, I'm really not sure <laughs> that anything is tremendously different than it has been in previous years when we've had hot weather and we've had fires and we've had the potential for utility outages. Those are almost a annual event. Unfortunately, they're almost an annual event. You know, the earthquake activity is always going on in Southern California and throughout California and the region that happens a lot as well. But, you know, with everything else going on with COVID, with what I will, con what I, will I guess, compassionately call a heightened sense of agitation amongst a lot of folks out there because of what COVID has imposed on us or what things COVID has trickled down in varying ways to impose on us. You know, it's a, it's a big stressor. There's a lot of things going on that are making people far more anxious, far more stressed out than they normally would be. 
So I'm really not sure that we're in any different situation if it weren't for the COVID scenario than we normally would be. But because there's additional precautions to be had, again, I think we're gonna probably extend if the weather forecast holds and certainly the fires are not calming down at all. We've been blessed so far in not having any agitators locally take advantage of the conditions. And I'm hoping that remains the same, but with all the heat that's been going on, you know, all we're doing is drying out the kindling and drying out the firewood, which is a sad and terrible thing to have happen. Um, I'm kind of happy that it's miserable from the heat perspective. I'm kind of happy that it's miserable from the humidity perspective and that we don't actually have dry Santa Ana's happening right now. That would be probably the worst of all of these scenarios. Um, we're gonna be putting some drills together. I had kind of commented on that. I've actually got an exercise that Jim Brower put together that we've been talking about for a while between Jim and myself. He's given me some updates even most recently as of this morning. So I need to review those with uh, Rob and with Dave. We'll probably be putting that somewhere in the September calendar for one of the meeting events. I think it'll be a really, really great tabletop exercise. And it'll be especially good as a refresher for folks that are fairly well versed in things that are disaster communication and preparedness orientation and oriented in general and work for other agencies. For folks that are brand new to Aries and folks that are kind of new to this, and even cross-functional within certain other agencies. I still think this will be an excellent refresher, if not a learning experience for them. So I'm looking forward to having that done. Um, I don't have anything else specifically, and unless Dave or Rob does, I would encourage us to get started and let's get K1CT going. All right, Danny had a couple of quick announcements there. If we can get that out of the way, then... Uh... We can get Rob going. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, there's a couple of good uh, applications out there. One of them is referred to as Wendy.com. It, it affords a lot of, has a lot of good settings in there in that program regarding the weather, wind patterns. Also shows the fires all over the United States, especially, unfortunately, California, Colorado, and Arizona and also describes the intensity of the fires, but good settings on there. Again, that's windy.com, supported by an OS or Android platform, as well as FireFinder. FireFinder is another good application. Uh, fire services use this quite a bit, and uh, also uh, some of the other agencies as well. I was turned on by to FireFinder by Al Clarkson, who's a retired uh, Federal Fire Division Chief, and they used it quite a bit when it was on active service. Uh, that's all I have. All right, thanks, Danny. Uh, I guess we are ready to go, Bill. If uh, you are, let's uh, get it started. I'll mute everybody, and uh, when you, except for you, and uh, we can go ahead. Okay, Dave, thanks. Let me uh, get to my share of screen here. We'll start off with some PowerPoint and then uh, go to uh, actual live demonstration showing uh, NBEMS working. As Bruce mentioned, NBEMS is actually a uh, the system and it has several subcomponents and we'll get into each of those. So it's a narrowband emergency messaging system, which has been around for uh, close to a decade and a half now. Uh, it was originally derived from uh, some of the work done on an older program that uh, we were talking about before the meeting started, uh, DigiPan. Uh, some of the same developers are involved with uh, NBEMS. So let me go in uh, full screen here. Hi, I'm uh, Bill K1CT, and uh, we have a digital net on Sunday mornings, and uh, this is the system we use. And so I thought I'd pass along some information, uh, hopefully to encourage some activity in that net and also to uh, kind of break some of the paradigms here and think about how to use this, particularly in field operations, as we've discovered due to some of the new robust modes that are part of NBMS now, uh, you can use this very effectively in the field from such things as uh, Android smartphones and uh, handy talkies, things we never thought we could be able to do so in the past. So uh, moving on. So NBMS is a collection of software applications uh, that uh, 
are written in Linux, but have been ported over to Windows, Mac, uh, BSD, Android, and others. Uh, so it has a, a big tent, as we like to say in the political world these days. Uh, lots of users can use this, uh, and uh, that makes it easy uh, to get maximum participation. Uh, and we can run it on everything from a smartphone, a tablet, uh, a laptop, a workstation. Uh, I don't know, maybe even some mainframe out there. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, a lot of flexibility in that regard. Uh, it's very flexible, in the, particularly because of uh, its multi-platformness and also the wide variety of modes that NBEMS uses. Uh, so it, uh, it complements other applications such as WinLink. Uh, it does not replace WinLink because WinLink has great capabilities as far as interfacing with the uh, internet and email, which is a really powerful feature. But uh, WinLink does not replace NBEMS because of its flexibility and portability and, and the ability to work at extremely uh, weak signal levels using some of the sophisticated uh, uh, modems that are part of NBEMS. And... Uh, that allows you to uh, use a QRP in situations when you're running on battery power out in the field. Uh, uh, you don't have to have a whole bunch of heavy equipment to, to run it. So the originators of NBMS had a different philosophy, whereas WinLink tends to operate almost semi-autonomously. I mean, you know, uh, a WinLink gateway station uh, doesn't have to have a person there. Uh, back in the old days, that was a controversial measure, particularly on HF, not so much on VHF, because we have lots of room and territory. But where uh, these Winlink uh, stations the, uh, were on uh, various places in the HF bands and there were uh, interference because there was no operator in attendance to prevent the system from uh, transmitting on somebody else. Nobody owns the frequency, obviously, in amateur radio and particularly on HF. And we all have to coexist together. So uh, that was part of the motivation for developing NBMS was to do similar sorts of things but with ensuring that an operator had to be in attendance to ensure maximum spectrum compatibility, we adapted our modes to use only the bandwidth that was required and also not to transmit on top of other users on the bands. <laughs> so that's sort of what was thinking about that. However, that's evolved over time. Uh, the original uh, modes were, were very narrow bands, such as PSK31, PSK63, and so on. But since that time, we moved on to a wider bandwidth modes, and so some of them are as wide as some of the WinLink uh, modes. For example, MT63-2000L, which is full uh, two kilohertz wide, and we even have wider ones than that. So, uh, like I say, the emphasis is on weak signal performance, to be able to get the message through overcoming adverse conditions. And we have lots of adverse conditions these days because we're at the low ebb of the sunspot cycle on HF. And um, some of the adverse conditions may even exist at VHF. For example, if your acoustic coupling from your uh, terminal into your handy talkie or your mobile radio, you obviously have background noise, people talking, wind noise, uh, car noise, all that sort of stuff. And some of these signals are robust enough to get through all that uh, background cruft and be demodulated error free. So who uses NBMS? Um, as was mentioned before we started uh, the presentation, uh, there are a number of uh, agencies uh, such as SHARES, MARS, uh, ARAS, so the Coast Guard Auxiliary is using uh, this as their main messaging uh, tool. Uh, and so interoperability between those uh, ac agencies and activities with ARAS is one of the key uh, reasons that we've been pushing this along over the years. We've been running this for over 13 years now, We're running a net on Sunday mornings and uh, yet, uh, basically, we're exercising ICS-213 messages and other uh, message forms as well. There's a whole number of them that come with uh, one of the NBEMS sub-programs known as FL Message, and we'll get into uh, some of those and show some examples. So interoperability is, is uh, one of the key drivers here. And uh, I guess the other thing is, is that infrastructure uh, NBEMS requires really very little infrastructure, and, and I'll illustrate that. So uh, here's my disclaimer. The Coast Guard Auxiliary offers a 14-hour course in using NBEMS. Obviously, we're not going to have 14 hours here to discuss this, but it's mainly message handling procedures and formats and using macros and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I can show you something here that doesn't touch a lot on those sorts of things. But that's what we uh, explore during our um, various uh, 
we our weekly nets is various different capabilities in, in using those. So we're just going to hit the high points here, wave tops, as they say in the Navy. So the MBMS software applications, FL Digi is the core one. That's the program that has the text screen of incoming text, outgoing text, and has all the different modems that, um, that produce and uh, demodulate the 155 plus modes that FL Digi uh, can uh, work with. Yeah, that's a astonishing number and it's been creeping up over the years. I remember when it was down below 60, and uh, now, and now we're up to 155. Some of them are uh, built for extreme robustness. They're very slow, but you need to go slow to be able to get the signal through. Uh, think, think of a satellite uh, or a space probe going out. Some of the uh, modulation techniques that are being used by FL Digi are the same as those uh, space probes that go out uh, millions of miles away and communicate back with Earth. And we're using similar sorts of ones in FL Digi to overcome things like noise and weak signals and that sort of thing. So FL Digi is uh, the primary thing I'm gonna to show today. FL Message I'm also gonna show, and that's the message formatting and reading application that takes uh, can generate ICS-213 message, ARL radiograms, other ICS messages, and uh, like there's 20 different ones it can do. And there's more being added at a time, and you can add uh, others on to the uh, standard list that comes with the program. And, uh, that uh, communicates with FL Digi to send and, and receive the messages. FLARC is another one, it's ARQ. This allows you to provide a automatic repeat request error correction so that you can send and receive binary files, just like packet. In fact, is it, those are packets, they just aren't AX.25 packets that we used in packet radio with WinLink on VHF and UHF. FL Wrap is something that we uh, sort of works in the background and it provides a wrapper with uh, a checksum so that when we have a message that comes through, uh, we can check to see if it got garbled anywhere along the ways. Most of the modes in FL Digi uh, include forward error correction. If anybody needs a, a tutorial on that, I have a little slide at the end we can talk about that. But forward error correction basically sends things more than once, sends things with various uh, uh, checksums so that if anything gets garbled, uh, you get two or three chances to uh, copy it correctly and the, the copied correctly ones where the checksum checks out are the ones that are accepted and displayed and transferred over to FL message. So that's FL wrap. The, the others there are ones that you use less frequently or are special purpose things. FL amp is a ability to send one to many and that's one of the big advantages of FL Digi since we are mainly using forward error correction. It's not just one station talking to another station. It could be one station talking to many stations. And if you have a message that needs to go out to a thousand different people, uh, if you have a, those thousand people are listening, they can all get the message at the same time. Now, other modes such as WinLink would have to send that message each separately a thousand different times. And uh, that would be, of course, clogging the communications channel, whereas this way we can do it uh, simultaneously. And FL app can uh, facilitate that. FL rig is a program that... Uh, Lots of rig control uh, is capable, uh, capable of controlling the system from the computer screen or from FL Digi. I don't use it. I'm uh, always an old school kind of guy. I like to turn the knobs, switch the modes and all that sort of things. Uh, but uh, for those who like rig control, it's available and it's uh, robust. Lots of different rigs are supported. And there are more, uh, including a logging program and so on that I won't get into. This is what uh, the FL Digi screen looks like. This is an older version. I'll show you the newest version or next to newest version uh, when we get into the actual live demo. And this shows uh, copying an FL uh, MT63-1000L signal down at the waterfall at the bottom of the screen. You can see the bandwidth of the signal it's centered on 1500 hertz. That's, by the way, the standard frequency we use for this uh, centering our uh, signal. We're transmitting normally uh, uh, on a single sideband radio on HF and we center our frequency in 1500 hertz. And the reason we do that is, is the second harmonic of that winds up by and large being outside the passband of our filters. So if we overdrive the signal uh, and create uh, harmonic and distortion products, those are filtered out by the single sideband transmitter. If we were to transmit using a lower tone frequency, the second harmonic or even the third harmonic could be within our uh, filter passband and that 
Croft would be sent out and that would be an undesirable thing. So we uh, do ourselves a favor by operating normally at 1500 hertz or even a bit higher uh, to uh, put our harmonics outside the passband so they're filtered out. This is actually a Coast Guard auxiliary display. You see those unusual call signs there. <laughs> Uh, and I'll just play a little bit of an audio clip that comes with this. This is an MT63-1000L signal. 63 carriers, forward error correction, multiple transmission times within the uh, transmission time. And this uh, thing, the L is the long interleave, and like I say, 1,000 hertz bandwidth. So it's not terribly narrow, not like PSK31, but uh, it's uh, still not uh, tremendously huge either. So we're going to try a whole play here. If anybody, uh, it's probably enough of that. <laughs> if anybody was an amateur a couple of decades or more ago, tuning around the HF spectrum, you would have heard signals that sounded very much like that because that was always used in the day of frequency division multiplex, where uh, various uh, teletype carriers were all. Uh, multiplex together by different tone frequencies and they sounded this uh, sort of sound that I always reminiscent of a propeller plane uh, flying by. Uh, that's how I thought of it as. In any case, this is uh, sort of a flashback to that. 63 different tones here simul simultaneously sending your message out and with error correction. Okay, that's FL Digi. Uh, this is a screen of FL Message, which links with FL Digi. And this is an ICS213 form as you type it into the system. This is an example from the uh, recent uh, community parks on the air event we had last weekend before the microwave contest. And uh, this is what we sent in uh, during that, uh, showing uh, Maidenhead Grid Square address and uh, the uh, public safety grid squares and the uh, latitude and longitude. That uh, can also be viewed as a uh, standard ICS-213 form in what's called the uh, view HTML. And uh, this is how it looks and you can print that out or you can save that to a file and present that to your served agency. And uh, they have that all available. By the way, back once upon a time before WinLink got its forms capability, the forms we used to send were actually from FL Message. We would uh, type up the ICS-213 form, save it, and attach it to the um, WinLink uh, message and uh, send those. Uh, we had interoperability back then. Then WinLink started getting their own forms, and so I think we're a little less interoperable between the two systems. Now it would be nice to have a translator since they're both HTML forms, but uh, there are some incompatibilities, and frankly, I haven't really pursued that much. Okay, so we have 155 or more modes, more coming each day. How do you choose what the proper one is so you can demodulate? Well, uh, band plans are one way to look at it. Um, band plans uh, show where things like uh, PSK31 would operate, uh, where FT8 operates, and that sort of thing. So that's one way to uh, at least uh, make some sort of a guess. And of course, developing your own listening skills, understanding what the bandwidth is, how fast the signal sounds. Uh, really, of those 155 modes within a given part of the spectrum, uh, uh, let's just think about some of the modes that are there. Some way exceed the uh, speed uh, limits the FCC has put on us for HF operation. And so those are not in contention, so that eliminates probably half of the modes. And if I'm in VHF, I'm probably using those other half modes for faster transmission. Uh, examining the signal structure and bandwidth on the waterfall displays, you saw that MT63 um, waterfall display that we showed earlier. Uh, you can uh, get a sense of what sort of signal it is. So use your eyes, use your ears, Develop the experience and expertise, follow the band plans, you can probably figure it out. But if you can't, there is a new uh, way of doing this, which I just tested out this morning. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out to be a failure, but uh, uh, great things come from failures. And that is smartphone apps that can identify signals. One that I tried was Tortillium's uh, SIG ID. And you just hold your smartphone up next to your receiver's speaker and uh, play the signal into it. And presumably it will just like 
Uh, some of the music applications where you will identify the song, this one will identify the uh, signal. Unfortunately, not all the F, uh, FL Digi uh, signals are uh, hosted in there, and I tried it against some of the ones that are, for example, 45 baud RTTY, 50 baud RTTY, and PSK31. For some reason, mine would not uh, recognize any of them, uh, but uh, that's just starting out trying it. I suspect it may, I may have a center frequency problem. And it's also a fairly immature program. But as time goes along, I'm sure they'll get it working because uh, what's required there has already been demonstrated by folks recognizing uh, tunes uh, over the system and why not recognize signals over the system. I'm not sure if you need to be connected to the Internet. I know for the music identification you do, and I suspect for this one you do as well. But I don't know. One of the things that comes with uh, FL Digi is TX ID and RX ID, transmitter ID and receiver ID. If I have those two capabilities turned on, they're on the upper right hand corner of the display, that when if I have TX ID on, when I send a signal out, I send out what's known as a Reed Solomon identification or RSID. And that Reed Solomon identification says what frequency I'm on, I'm transmitting on for center tuning. And it also tells me what mode I'm in. And if RXID is turned on by the station receiving me, it will automatically recognize that RSID and center on the frequency being transmitted and switch the mode to the mode being transmitted. It's pretty reliable, but not always. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, we use it on our net uh, on Sunday mornings, and it, it works reasonably well. Uh, probably... The signals aren't terrible, probably a 90% or better probability of, of it functioning. But of course, we always do mention when we make a mode change on our voice coordination uh, channel. Just to make sure we don't leave anybody behind. Okay, let's talk about some of the usual modes. Well, on HF, uh, we can start off with things like PSK31, although that's glacially slow. MT60 and doesn't have anything as far as error correction in it, whereas MT63-1000L does have error correction, is a bit faster. Uh, it requires a fairly good signal level to decode uh, error-free. Uh, Olivia 81000 is uh, more robust, uh, but slower, and it really is good for getting the message through, and even better is Olivia 8500. One of the key differences between MT63-1000L and the Olivia's is that uh, MT63 is simultaneously sending out those 63 carriers. Well, that's a very complicated waveform for a linear amplifier to handle and do so without distortion. So it's very important not to overdrive your amplifier uh, so you don't put out uh, spurious products. And remember, I talked about centering on 1500 hertz so, so to eliminate some of your spurious products from being transmitted, at least the harmonic, uh, harmonically related ones. Well, the good news about Olivia uh, is 8100, 8500, or there's several other uh, modes of Olivia, is that uh, it only transmits a signal uh, one frequency at a time. It hops around between frequencies to send its various uh, bits of data, and uh, you can run full transmit power. Uh, you don't have to back things off to prevent distortion. So you can, uh, since you're only sending one frequency, there is no distortion. It's like sending a CW or an FSK signal. And uh, so that's a really powerful. You can run a 100-watt transmitter at 100 watts output, whereas an MT63 signal, you probably need to back down to an indicated uh, 20 or 30 watts to prevent the crest factor from uh, creating distortion. MFSK is a similar signal to Olivia. Uh, it doesn't have quite as much error correction, but we uh, use that one as well. MFSK 16 also has the ability, in addition to sending text, it also has the ability to send pictures, which is kind of neat. Uh, on VHF and UHF, we use high-speed uh, signals, and I'll give a demonstration of this with PSK 500R, R standing for robust. Uh, with more embedded uh, forward error correction. Uh, MT63-2000L is also used, uh, but it's a bit slower than the PSK-500R. And we'll demonstrate some of those during the demonstration phase. So uh, where do I get the software? There's the location, uh, sourceforge.net. Uh, look for FL Digi. Uh, no problem, you'll, you'll have it. So you can start off with uh, just listening in 
and uh, decoding things, both uh, on our net or on the air, uh, just normal ham operation and decoding PSK31 signals and so on. Uh, you can start with acoustic coupling. No sound card interface is required. You just have your uh, computer near your radio uh, playing through the speaker and uh, your computer microphone listening to that, and it will decode pretty darn well. As you advance, you can move on to a sound card interface, and I would really uh, recommend, particularly on HF, to have a sound card interface so that you don't transmit spurious background noises in the data portion of the bands. On VHF, it's much less critical because we don't have a data portion of the band. We are transmitting on voice portions of the band, and uh, so it's not a, a violation of anything to have background noises as long as it's not music. So... Um, one other thought here is if you are presently set up for such modes as FT8, Vera, or Winmore, or any of those, uh, all you need to do is add the NBEMS software packages, uh, including FL Digi, and you'll be up and operating. And here we are at the simplest uh, solution, and this is great for the field. We use this on the community uh, parks on the air as a uh, Baofeng derivative uh, handheld and a Android smartphone. Typed up my ICS 213 message, held this phone up to the uh, handy talkie, hit the transmit button, hit the send button on the on the uh, NBEMS program, and away the message went. And a lot faster than if I had had to uh, recite it using voice. I probably would have blown out the finals in the in the radio if I'd had to do that. But sending it on PSK 500R, uh, it went pretty fast. Sound card interfaces. Uh, there's a number, a number of ways to do this. You can use the sound card in the computer, which is what we'd be using for acoustic coupling or hardwired coupling, or we can have an external sound card like the signal link, uh, which is connects to the USB. By the way, our, our, there are new versions of uh, USB sound card that have come out over the last uh, several months or maybe even a year that offer higher performance than the signal link. Uh, newer chips, and they offer wider bandwidths, which can uh, lead to higher data throughput rates. Uh, and they've done that primarily to support things like Vera FM and Vera HF, uh, which uh, are stressing the signal link. Uh, you can, some of the higher data rate modes of the signal link uh, does not support where these new uh, cards do. So, um, Moving on to the conventional sound card interface. So there's a number of these around. I'm sure you can almost get them for almost nothing these days because most people use the USB sound card uh, interfaces. But the ones using the computer sound card uh, for hardwired, uh, MFJ has made them in West Mountain Research and so on. It takes the sound card in a line in and out and interfaces them to your radio and also develops a push-to-talk line to turn the radio on when you're transmitting. Uh, very cool. and. Uh, the only downside to this is that, particularly for HF operation, if you don't take the effort to uh, mute your Windows uh, alarm sounds, like, oh, I got an email in or uh, something else or a text come in or whatever, you normally get an alarm for those. Well, those uh, make sounds and they'll go right out your sound card interface and go out over the air. Uh, that's really annoying. <laughs> Uh, you may also find that if you're streaming audio from uh, YouTube or wherever else, podcast or some such thing, that might go out as well. You don't want that to happen, obviously. So uh, uh, that is one of the downsides of this, and probably one of the main reasons people go to USB sound cards is that they can direct their amateur radio data uh, transmission and reception over the USB sound card, and everything else goes to the computer sound card. Here's how we uh, rig up the sound card. Uh, PC goes to signal link, signal link goes to transceiver. Uh, that's both the uh, transmit and receive audio and the switching for uh, when we go to transmit, it uh, switches the uh, transmitter on. A uh, number of radios have added USB sound card interfaces that are uh, about the same capability as the signal link. And uh, those are built into the transceiver, the FT, uh, excuse me, the uh, IC7300, the IC7200, the IC7100, and the Kenwood 590 all have these built in, and I'm sure there's many, many more. Uh, but that allows you to not have a signal link, which is handy, because the less stuff you have to carry to the field, the better. So you can just go PC to transceiver and uh, send and receive uh, your digital data that way. 
Okay, that sort of concludes my presentation. Um, before I get into the actual demonstration, do we have any questions? I'll stand by. Yeah, if you have any questions for Bill, uh, click the raise your hand button and uh, we'll see what we can do. Meanwhile, I'll go over to uh, my other display. I have one from a uh, question from Jay. They have six. Hi, Jay. Go ahead. Hey, Bill. So I, um, I guess I should turn the video on too, just for giggles. So I uh, installed FL Digi, and um, um, maybe there's a magic setting in your uh, that you'll cover in your demo, but uh, the rig control stuff isn't working. I'm on a Mac, and uh, wondered where you thought I should go uh, look. Or should I hunt up a, a solution for this? There seem to be a bunch of guys on YouTube and they, they, they say what to do and it doesn't, uh, doesn't do the job. Roger, Jay. Um, as far as, like I say, I have not really gotten into the rig control aspects. Uh, I, um, I set my own frequencies and set my own modes. So <laughs> I'm afraid I'm probably not the person to help you there. But I know that there are folks on our Sunday net, and I would encourage you to join that and to discuss that uh, issue with them. Uh, I know it is achievable to do it, and I know people are successful. I know it's easier on a Windows machine than a Mac, but uh, anything's possible, and people have made it work. And uh, I think that'd be one place to start. There's also an NBEMS um, or IO groups uh, that you can join and ask those sorts of questions there. And uh, perhaps you you get the right answer, but uh, I'm afraid I'm uh, there's lots of so many facets of this. Uh, the part that I use is, is mainly just the uh, sending, receiving the, the signals using FL Digi and the uh, FL Message program. All right, we have the uh, the other Jay has a question. Yes, only. Yes, Questions here. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, where do you see? Uh, you said there's 155 modes in there now. What's coming? Is there is there any um, new developments on the horizon with this technology? Well, one of the uh, good things about this is that the uh, NBEMS project is all open source uh, uh, software. And if somebody is developing a new modem and it's open source, uh, it will probably get uh, brought into FL Digi as time goes along. For, uh, for example, FSQ Call, which is a very, very robust, uh, but very, very slow uh, data transfer program, uh, or modem, I should say, uh, that was brought in within a few months after it was developed and, and brought into the system. So, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of like everybody's part of the team. If you develop something and if it's uh, considerably worthwhile and somebody is willing to help out with the integration and bring it in, uh, it'll happen. Uh, but as far as where we're going with this, uh, uh, Dave Freeze, uh, W1HKJ, is probably the one who knows best. and <laughs> He's not on the call. All right, we have another question from Pat uh, and Chat. How do you reduce the size of the waterfall horizontally? And what modem is higher than the signal link? Ah, okay. Uh, actually, uh, you sent out a, uh, a uh, I, think, I think it was Dave that sent it out, might have been Rob, uh, recently sent out on our uh, IO groups uh, messaging. It was a presentation on, the, on one of these new sound cards. I watched that, and um, I believe they have a uh, RA or DA uh, prefix on them, and the, uh, the suffix is the number of dollars the uh, uh, device costs. Uh, does anybody, uh, does it ring a bell with anybody? Yes, I remember seeing it. I don't remember the name right off the top of my head. I'll do some looking while we're talking here. Yeah, that, that's that's probably uh, I've, I've seen uh, on our Coast Guard auxiliary site that there's a lot of folks that are transitioning that 
uh, so it supports uh, the Vera modes better than the signal link because, like I say, the signal link's been around a while and the chipset in there is uh, not at the state of the art. Was there another question? Yeah, you wanted to know how do you reduce the size of the waterfall horizontally? I, I have never seen a way to do it, so. Well, I've done it and, my, and I've done it by accident. So uh, we'll, uh, when I bring up the display, we'll see if we can figure that out. All right. We may be successful. <laughs> All right, and Dennis has a question, N1 TEN. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, two things for, for J, AF6 GM. Uh, I know I participate, there is a Win FL Digi uh, Groups IO uh, that uh, covers the kinds of questions that he's um, interested in. I don't know because I don't have a reason uh, to look if there's an equivalent for uh, Mac or Apple. But um, if, if he'd like, uh, I can send at least the Win, the Win link or win FL Digi version over to him and he can take a look at that. Um, then the other uh, item was you were just talking about the DRA uh, sound cards and yes that was a very good presentation by the designer and manufacturer of that uh, sound card um, that uh, was uh, in one of the links that uh, NAKBC sent out and I read read and listened to that and found it interesting. Although um, the item is a kit and you have to have to build it yourself as opposed to uh, a signal link. Back to you. All right. All right, and thank you, Ian. I uh, just posted a link in chat uh, for the DRA sound cards. It's masterscommunications.com. Uh, and they have several different versions of a uh, 30, 36, 45, and a 50. And uh, you'd have to read their description of each one to see which one is going to suit your situation better. Hey, Bill, could yes, you one comment, please, on the uh, CW translation abilities? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. FL Digi does have the ability of demodulating and sending uh, CW. And uh, it works reasonably well. I won't say it's perfect, but uh, particularly if the other station is sending with a keyer or sending with FL Digi or other keyboard type uh, uh, CW Morse uh, programs, uh, FL Digi can copy that pretty well as, as long as there's not a lot of uh, background distractions for it. Uh, so it may be a way that you can uh, uh, fill in the gaps on your own code copying capability and using that together may actually improve your code copying capability as uh, you step up the speed, uh, you can use the program to copy it and you can copy it in your head along with it and probably learn where uh, you make mistakes and, uh, and correct them. Uh, it all depends on how you use it. If you use it as a substitute for yourself, obviously you're not gonna uh, improve your capability, but if you augment yourself with it, uh, it may actually help you uh, develop greater CW skills. So uh, that's a interesting capability of it. And yes, just like CW Skimmer, it can uh, decode multiple uh, CW signals within its passband. And that's uh, also the case for many of the digital modes is that it will simultaneously uh, decode uh, signals and put them on the, the left of the display for everything in your passband, uh, much like FT8 does uh, with WSJTX. And you can see uh, uh, the band activity on, on this CW Skimmer uh, kind of uh, display. So are we, uh, any other questions, Dave, or are we ready to go uh, try? Uh... I think we're ready to go, Bill. Okay, let's give this a... Okay, what I have here, uh, you should be seeing this now, is my uh, FL Digi display. Uh, you can see the waterfall going there and my voice is uh, all that uh, stuff showing up in the, in the yellow color uh, on the otherwise blue waterfall going down. Okay, and what I'm going to do is, uh, as I mentioned, there's an Android version of this and I'm going to be sending uh, a message that I have on my Android phone using a, a program called ANDFLMSG or Android FL Message. And Android FL Message actually includes the FL Digi modems in it. 
we have a passing uh, helicopter here, so that's going to provide some background noise, noise to show the robustness or other or not of the system. So this will be in PSK 500R, which is one of the ones that we uh, use during the community parks on the air drill. And it's a fairly fast uh, program. Uh, it has uh, interleaved error correction, forward error correction to help get the message through uh, despite the background noise. So And here we go. Okay, that completes the message. Now let's take a look at what the message looks like. Well, you saw the text come across the screen, obviously. And this is the weather report that we is what we use for exercising our FL message uh, capabilities during the Sunday morning uh, nets. And we'll go over to uh, FL message, and I'm going to have to probably s share that. Hey, Bill, could you say again the name of the uh, Android program you used? It's, uh, I'll spell it phonetically. Alpha, November, Delta. Foxtrot, Lima, Mike, Sierra, Golf. And that's uh, an acronym for Android FL Message. Thank you. Sure. And going back to here, sorry, there's lots of opportunities to excel here with <laughs> multiple programs open. And stop sharing this one. I'm going to go here and open up and that should show you that's what I copied from the phone over onto my FL message. And now I'm going to deliver that by going into see view and HTML delivery. And now I'll stop sharing that because I don't think that will share through unless I select it. And there's the uh, ICS 213 message that we sent. So, uh, that's sort of my demonstration of doing it. Uh, MT63 uh, 2000L would be another uh, one we could have sent. It's probably more robust, uh, able to overcome background noises and unfidelity through the repeaters, but uh, that can also be used for sending and receiving messages a little bit slower. So uh, uh, we wanted to see if we could change the waterfall size. So let me go back to that. Okay, so now we're here on the waterfall, and um, I have done this before. <laughs> oh, there you go. Just hit the button, and uh, you can change the... Uh, change how much bandwidth you have there. For the person who asked, I think that was Pat, was that WA6MHZ, how do you change it? And there's your answer. Does that answer the question? I guess you're probably on mute. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not. I, I, anything else uh, that we want to address on this? That, that pretty much I concludes guess, what I had in mind. I guess I was on mute and I got a yes, thank you from Pat. Oh, awesome, thank you. All right, now we got a bunch of questions. Dennis, you're first. I uh, just wanted to amplify that uh, I was on the receiving end of Bill's uh, test activity 
and uh, we used the sharp repeater. And uh, it was a very clever uh, use of the repeater uh, to extend the range and not have to deal with uh, the vagaries of uh, simplex. And uh, definitely worth uh, trying out uh, in a larger context. Very good, very good. That's, uh, there are a lot of repeaters that will pass uh, digital information. So uh, something uh, to keep in mind uh, should the need arise here. Uh, Mike, Flynn Springs, go ahead. Yeah, uh, question, Bill. Uh, we've never used FL AMP. I just wondered uh, if you could uh, uh, explain when we would use something like that. Uh, yes, uh, we, we actually use this on our Sunday NIP, but probably haven't done so for two or three years. Uh, it, it makes the forward error correction even more robust. Uh, and it, it's really useful for, um, for sending long messages, particularly, to um, lots of different stations. And it, uh, what it does is it, uh, you can see the progress of receiving an incoming uh, message uh, with a uh, progress bar at the bottom of things. And so you uh, uh, have a good idea whether or not you've missed anything along the way. But it, it, once again, it's for one to many, robust uh, forward error correction, and uh, with a progress uh, in indicator on there. And if you want, we can try this on Sunday since you're a regular participant in the net. Uh, it'd be uh, good to show that off and kind of resurrect our, our use of that. Would you like to do that? That sounds good. Yeah, I'd like to learn how to use it. So in other words, it replaces that uh, FL message. You use the FL lamp instead. Is that correct? Uh, we would have to play with it again. I don't. I, I think we still format our message in FL message, but uh, uh, we pipe it through FL lamp to uh, take advantage of the more robust uh, forward error correction and then the progress monitoring. Monitoring. Well, thank you. Mm hmm. Dave, any, any other questions? Any other additional questions for Bill? Could you go back to the SL Digi display again? I'm trying to understand what I'm seeing there and reconcile it with what I see on my display. Sure, I'll uh, share it here again. There we are. So in the upper left is a frequency, 70 yes, uh -huh. three. And then there's a frequency and then an, an offset, 1804. And then offset puts it back into the handbands. Oh, right uh, this 403.5 is a shears frequency that we use. And uh, so um, my apologies for using non-amateur frequencies on my presentation here. I'm, I hope that doesn't lead to any confusion, but that does show the interoperability things as I do use this on Coast Guard Auxiliary and for shares. Okay. What is uh, the let's... typical frequency for a given mode, you know, to try to listen, uh, or is that something I should just wait until tomorrow and try? Well, um, what, what we do, um, uh, of course, PSK31, uh, I guess the most popular frequency for that, you can test out your FL Digi on, would be 14070. That's where a lot of the, uh, the PSK watering hole is. At least I think that's still the case. Of course, a lot of PSK31 activity has sort of migrated to FT8. FT8 is a great program, but it's not something you use for handling ICS-213 or other message trafficking. You're just using that mainly to make uh, contacts and signal reports and exchanging grid squares. But beyond that, it, it becomes uh, cumbersome and not so easy. It's a, like I say, great contesting or searching out grid squares or bouncing signals off of meteors or moon or things like that. And whereas FL Digi, the forte is to uh, actually uh, send and receive uh, a fair amount of data. Uh, 14070 is one of the frequencies. I think a 7070 might be one on the 40 meter band where you'd see PSK 31. Okay, so if I put 1470 in the display, it shows uh, a frequency of 14071.5. So does that mean I should change my radio to be 14071.5? 
Well, that frequency that you're putting in uh, up at the upper or left-hand corner should be what you're commanding your radio to go to. Okay. And then uh, adding the uh, tone frequency, the 1. Uh, 1,500 hertz to that, so that should put you up at 1,500 hertz above that, which uh, you see on the on my uh, display here um, is at uh, 7404.999, or basically 7405. So adding 1.5 kilohertz, which is 1,500 hertz, on top of 7403.5 equals 7405 uh, kilohertz. And that's what that... Uh, all comes together at. <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah, uh, that's used for rig control uh, mostly, but uh, I put that in there because uh, that allows the uh, RSID to calculate what the actual RF frequency is rather than just the tone frequency. But it's, uh, if you're not using rig control, it's not terribly relevant, really. Right. Okay, very good. Uh, one of the things that's kind of neat we found out uh, during our Sunday nets is the difference in frequency between various radios. Because you can determine the frequency being used down to one hertz, um, those stations who are using a high uh, accuracy temperature controlled uh, oscillators on their radios uh, can really uh, get a, a very fine bead on the frequency. And those of us who are not, uh, my radio I, I've discovered is six hertz off. And so I can uh, compensate for that uh, six hertz off by setting my audio frequency a little bit different and uh, that all nets things together even, even better. But uh, there's all kinds of capabilities within this program. You can actually calibrate it against WWV tones and uh, calibrate your sound card to uh, get the best uh, accuracy out of the system. Of course, that will not calibrate your radio. Uh, that's an adjustment inside that you, I would consult your service manual on how to do. Well, Dave, I think that's it for me. Please join us on Sunday mornings about 9.15 on 3572 kilohertz. That's usually where we have our frequency, but that is subject to change in accordance with the noise and the sunspots. Thank goodness we're getting some sunspots again. That's all I have. 73 from K1CT. All right, and you do uh, sort of a uh, voice communication or coordination on the Aries talk group? Right, uh, ARES DMR talk group and the uh, 224.9 Condor 220 Club repeater, both uh, time sharing on those. For those who are analog only, we're on the 220 repeater, and those who have DMR, we're on the DMR talk group. All right. I'm trying to catch all these uh, things in chat here. Uh, everybody's saying thank you, great presentation, and I agree. Uh, I've caught a couple of things that I had uh, forgotten about. I haven't used it for a while, so uh, it'd be time to get back in there again. Any additional questions for Bill? And Bill, you'll send this uh, presentation later on and we'll get it on the, uh, the website. Uh, yes, sir. We'll do that. And since we're recording this, we'll... Uh, as soon as they close the meeting out, we'll get a recording going and get it to Rob so we can uh, do a little uh, final editing and uh, get that posted as well. Anything else? Bruce, do you have anything else for this morning? No, I don't. Chris, presentation. Thank you, Bill. Good refresher for myself as well. I haven't touched that in probably at least a year. Um, and yes, you're correct. The number of different things it will go out and work on has very steadily <laughs> increased since the times that we went out and did our initial presentations and installs and workshops for that. So I wasn't aware that we were at 155 and still growing. Yeah, I didn't uh, really looked at all of them myself and it's, uh, it's definitely grown since I first started using this program, that's for sure. Uh, Rob, do you have anything else? Uh, nothing else. Thank you. All right. Well, if uh, we don't have anything else, we'll go ahead and bring this to a close. And uh, we'll be getting some information out on uh, an HF rally for uh, next Saturday. Thanks, everybody, for being there. Uh, Bill, great presentation. Thank you. And uh, we will carry on. Thank you. Out here. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bill.
Thanks, Bill.